Namaste, everyone, and welcome, <laughs> welcome to the Anchor Light. Um, what day is it anyway? Friday here in the United. No, is it Friday? I think it's Friday. Yeah, Friday in the United States and the rest of the world. It's already Saturday, and here we are as we continue our preparation for the Wesak Festival on Sunday, where you have the massive amounts of downpouring spiritual energy. Um, we'll just uh, continue with the Eightfold Path. If you remember. Uh, Monday, we did right viewpoint. Uh, Wednesday, we did right thoughts, right speech, right action and, or behavior, and then <clears throat> and right livelihood and lifestyle. So today, to fish it, finish it up, we'll talk about right spiritual effort and endeavor, right awareness and memory, and right oneness. So before we start, let's ask for a blessing, shall we? To the divine supreme God, divine Father, Mother, to all the spiritual elders, holy masters, to all the saints of all traditions, archangels, holy angels, and spiritual helpers. Personally, to my teacher, Master Tuak Hoksui Mahagu Jumailing, we thank you for divine light, divine love. Thank you for your compassionate, purifying light and soothing healing energy. We thank you in full faith. And so it is. All right. So just as a quick review, so there's a continu continuity. You have right viewpoint, which is the most important one. You know, you say, I've heard that already. Mm -hmm. Because you forget that part, the rest don't matter. Right vantage point, right? You're looking at everything. From the viewpoint of who the I am, which is the soul. And the body, the emotions and thoughts, <clears throat> all of these are things that happen outside of the I. Alright, now, from there, once you have the right viewpoint, then you realize the thoughts, the emotions that affect your speech and action are not the I. Then you can say, okay, I control the thoughts, the emotions, the movements of the body, so what is the right way to think? Make sense? I, the soul, what is the right way to think? What's the right thing to say? And what are the right things to do? Make sense? And if you put together right thoughts, right speech, right action, do it over and over again, they become right habits. And right habits done over and over again becomes, become virtues, like a virtue. And if you live by your life as much as you can, based on virtues, then you affect your entire lifestyle. Make sense? So, that is a quick summary of what we covered before. Now, let's go to right spiritual effort and endeavor. If you were part of it, I know a lot of you were with us also in a seven-day purification. I emphasize that right spiritual effort is connected to the virtue of constancy of aim and effort and non-laziness. Or, my own opinion, non-lazy assness. <laughs> okay? And this is very important because a lot of people on the spiritual path have a tendency to think, well, I'm on the spiritual path, you know, I'm just going to float and just go with the flow whenever the inspiration comes through and I just move with it. Nope. Doesn't work that way. In fact, I was sharing with the group this morning uh, when I was talking to my teacher, I said, I thought that was the perception. Okay? Perception. That was my perception of how great spiritual teachers are, like Paramahansa Yogananda, you know, all these great teachers, they just kind of, you know, whatever happens, happens. Their basic chakra is not that big. They're big on the top. They're very loving and caring, uh, but they're not like, like this. And message just said, the fact that they have great following is a manifestation of their highly, highly, highly awakened and activated basic chakra. And I heard that ago. What? That's when he told me, he said, spiritual development is reflected in the results you produce in the world. And I go, I thought they're separate. I thought, that's why people are on the spiritual path or on the material path. No, they're two sides of the same coin. Spirituality, true spirituality, has to produce results. I know, a lot of people use spirituality as an escape, Right? It's too stressful, you know, whatever it is in their life or their household, their relationship or their work, it's too stressful, stressful. So they use spirituality as an escape. In a way, it's correct in the sense that, oh, it's stressing you out, so you want to learn how to meditate, how to be able to better regulate your emotions and your thoughts so you'll be able to handle the stress and be still be effective. Make sense? Unfortunately, a lot of people, and I'll sh share this, I know some of you will not like it. Unfortunately, I've seen way too many people use spirituality as an excuse to take drugs. To go out and just not fulfill the responsibilities. 
because they're spiritual. They don't like stress. So if you don't like stress, good luck. Anything that you want to succeed in, listen carefully. Anything you want to succeed in, be it being healthier, better relationships, educational attainment, spiritual development, there will be stress. Because stress is nothing more. As far as the soul is concerned, it's a time of adjustment. I'm so used to doing this, now I have to do this. So the stress is like, oh, it's something new. What? You mean I have to actually get up and go to work? Or in order to be able to meditate more, I need to make sure my body can handle all that energy. Does that mean I have to get up and exercise? You mean I have to take care of my body? I thought the body is just an earthly thingy. My soul is way above in the heavens. So it causes stress. Stress, if you don't have stress, I know this is going to go against what a lot of you think. Having no stress means you're cruising. Like, okay, everything's cool, everything's stress. Uh, everything's like cruising. But if you want to attain anything, anything, including spiritual development, there will be a certain level of uncomfortable sensation. Because being uncomfortable means you're changing, you're transforming. But as with everything else, things can be twisted by people. Oh, I don't want to do that. I've done that oh, you know, in the corporate for so many years. I just want to just relax and, you know, whatever. Go retire in a, by the beach or by the mountains and do nothing. That's fine and great. If your finances are in order, you're taking care of the people you're supposed, you have responsibilities with, and you don't have anything to aspire for. Yeah, go for it. But you already know, no progress. People lose interest, people die. Progress is the key. You have to feel like, or sense that there is movement, there's progress. You know, I have to have more inner peace now than I did last week. I have to be able to regulate my emotions better now than I did a year ago. Well, there has to be progress. Progress is what the, keeps you, quote unquote, alive. And I remember, um, what's his name? Oh uh, yeah, what am I saying? Tony Robbins, I've <laughs> been talking about him. I remember he was sharing that statistically, Men that retire within five years, statistically, a lot of them die. Five years. And I know a few people like that. They retired. They just watch TV, you know, because they worked their ass off all their life. And now there's like, I don't want to do that anymore. So they don't do anything. And before you know it, some weird, I mean, just weird, just develop some ailment, some ailment. Boom, body dies. So there's a direct connection, no direct connection. Who knows? But if you think about it, when you don't aspire for anything, you're just floating. It's like you're smoking weed all day long, and you're just like, yeah, everything's cool. There's no purpose in life. That's not following the Eightfold Path. There has to be some purpose in a person's life. So in the Eightfold Path uh, number six, which is right spiritual effort and exertion, that also means whatever you want to do in your life, anything, anything from your health, your relationships, your finances, your spiritual development, your mental development, there has to be constancy of aim and effort and non-laziness. Constancy of aim means what? You have to have a target. The day you wake up that you don't have any target, the day you decline or degenerate. I see no goal, no whatever, whatever. At some point, nothing's interesting, nothing to aspire for, that's it. Downward spiral. At that point, the soul is losing control of the body, the emotions, thought, because there's nothing for the soul to exert itself, to generate certain lessons that, not generate, but to acquire certain lessons. So the soul says, oh, why are we staying here for? The body, the emotions, thoughts are lazy asses. They want to do anything. Let's leave. I'm leaving. There has to be something you're aspiring for. It doesn't have to be a change the world. And I've seen people in the spiritual path, yeah, I want to change the entire world. Uh, okay, why don't, we, why don't you fix your life first? Fix your finances, your health, and something you have control over. Before it's sitting there going, I want to change the economic system of the world. I want to transform all the people in Africa. Uh, fix your life. They don't want to hear that because... Then you find out the reason they're aspiring to fix this and fix that so that it distracts them from fixing their life. Ouch. I know after this talk, I'm going, I don't want to listen to this guy anymore.
whatever, now must go away. Okay, clear? Right spiritual effort, right exertion. And that's the part where I also share about uh, the book I always recommend, The One Thing. A lot of us have a tendency, I say us because me included, we have a tendency to mistake busyness, activity, for productivity. Think about it. A lot of us get so busy, meeting after meeting after meeting, the question is, at the end of the day, did it produce results? What do you mean results? It's not the, it's not the, tar, you know, it's not, what do you say? I know people always quote things left and right to suit them. It's not the destination, it's the journey. Yeah, I think Confucius or Lao Tzu said that. Of course, people would say, oh, let me do that so I don't have to produce results. I just got to be busy and look like I'm busy. Try and doing that at work. Meeting after meeting, doing this, at the end of the day, the boss says, okay, did you do anything? Did you produce anything? No, I'm still thinking about it. Yeah, you're going to get your ass fired. <laughs> just like, the way, in my case, that's what I used to do. Message will come to the United States, says, how many students have you produced? How many learned pranic healing? How many souls have you transformed? Master, you know, I'm going to meetings. I'm meeting with this church. I'm meeting with this organization. In other words, I was showing him I'm busy. He'll listen. And he goes like this. And how many classes have you taught? How many healers do you have now? I'm going, he wasn't listening to all this stuff I was telling him. Yeah. Because they were just what? A mirage. Just, I'm busy doing this, doing that, doing this. Are there results? Nope. Don't count. And some of you are getting upset now. Go, That's too harsh. Life demands results. Period. Full stop. Everything. From your relationships to your health. You cannot say, well, you know, I want to be healthy. So I'm, I bought this cookbook on how to cook good food, uh, healthy food. I uh, joined this gym because uh, they have the best equipment and the best trainers. Uh, what else? Uh, I'm, I'm got a juicer and all that stuff. So you have everything ready. But if you don't step into the gym and exercise, you don't start getting the food to stuff into your face that's good for your health. You're not doing juicing, whatever it is that you think is good. Those intentions are completely useless. I know, that's not like, that's not a spiritual thing to say. Ask me if I care. That's why I always tell people, seekers are achievers. If there's true spiritual connection, the energy of the soul controls the body, controls the emotion and thoughts directed to whatever target they want to achieve. That's what your way to be a great soul. That's a great soul. It's not a great soul. A great soul is not like you talk to them, yeah, man, what? Yeah, the universe is full of love. I'm loving. Mm -hmm. And somebody's suffering, you know, people are hungry. Oh, God bless you. That God bless you thing is not going to feed their hungry stomach. Get the idea? So, right spiritual effort means the ability to focus on what you want, what is your objective, and following through. So, write this down. Your spiritual development and attainment is reflected in the results you produce. That didn't come from me. That came from my teacher. Your spiritual development, okay, has to be reflected in the results you produce. No results, Eh, just action, busyness, talk, 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 meeting after meeting, but not producing anything. That's why I love that book, The One Thing. <clears throat> Gary Keller, what's his name? Gary Keller, J. Papasan. Amazing book, but it'll kick your ass. Guaranteed. Then you get to see, yeah, I'm busy, but I'm not producing anything. Oh, okay, okay, complete waste of time. <laughs> it is. Not a slight waste of time. It's a complete waste of time. That's how you raise your own standards. That's how you raise your standard. So, to summarize the book in one sentence, okay? This is not a replacement. I'm just saying this is a takeaway, which will, from there, everything follows. What is the one thing you can do, such that such by doing it, everything else is unnecessary? 
So the way he describes is, what is the one domino, the big domino you have to topple and everything else will follow. So for example, I really want to develop spiritually. I want to have more inner peace, stillness. I want to have emotional control. So on, so on, so on. That's what you want. Okay, ask yourself a question. What is the one thing I can do to, that all this is taken care of? Some of you could say, I will get up two hours early in the morning for the next two months and really stick to it and do my morning meditation. That could be it. For some of you, by doing that, what happens? It changes your entire day. You have a better outlook in life. You have better control. It could be that. Or it could be, you know, I'll read one spiritual book per week. Make sense? You just have to demand more of yourself. The problem with people, again, I apologize if this sounds negative, but it is what it is. The problem is a lot of people keep giving themselves excuses. That's the number one reason people fail. They mistake, oh, I love myself, so I'll give myself stupid excuses not to succeed. That's it, you're screwed. If you truly love yourself, you'll raise your standards so that you will really manifest the greatness that is you. That's how you really love yourself. It's not like giving yourself all these stupid excuses. I can't, I didn't do it because, you know, I love myself. I don't want to have too much stress. I love myself, well, whatever crap. I, I listen to these people, I'm going, are you done? Or are you just giving, coming up with all these stupid excuses? Right? Raise your standard. Raising your standard. Just when you thought, man, I experienced that inner peace, there's more. I've had this much of a savings, this much investment, can have more. It's not being greedy. A lot of people in the spiritual path think, oh, you're too attached. Yeah, and you too are touched doing nothing. Accomplishment, accomplishment, accomplishment. A great soul has accomplished a lot. Right spiritual effort. Right exertion. Constancy of aim. Always have a target and effort. Keep going towards that objective and not, don't let anything stop you. You already know that, right? If there's a boulder in front of you, what did my teacher say? My sister said, go to the left, be like water. Go to the left, go to the right, go below, go above. It doesn't work, blast through it. And I remember in that book, uh, I think Gary Carroll also said, I think it's from the book, I forgot already, but a lot of books. At least that's right. Ah, a hundred watt bulb, you know, like light bulb. A hundred watt light bulb will light up a room. You know, ambient lighting, you just kind of radiate. Nice. Give the ambience. If you take that 100 watt of power and aim that light the size of a needle or even a pencil, it can burn through steel. That's how you succeed. Anything. Not just about money. This is not just money. Anything you do. If you don't accomplish anything in different parts of your life, in many parts of your life, you don't feel fulfilled. That's just what it is. Clear? So right spiritual effort, right exertion means what? Have a goal, have a target. And you already know this, I've shared this so many times. What is your goal? What is your target? Why do you want to achieve that target? How do you want to achieve that target? And when do you want to achieve that target? Write this down. What? Why? How? When? And the last part is execute. That's it. What is your target? Spiritually. What do you want to be in a year? Two years? Five years? Whatever. You want to have, be enlightened? You want to experience peace? You want to feed a thousand people? A hundred people? What is it? What is it? It starts with a what? Why? What do you want to do? It? I got nothing else to do. Well, that's not good enough. As Tony Robbins says, how big is your why? That is your compelling reason that will keep you going when you have obstacles in front of you. How? You have to have a task list. What are, the, are, what are the tasks I need to do to get to my objective? Here's the problem. A lot of people, they have a what, and they immediately go to how. And once they see that the how doesn't work so well, that there's some obstacles, they give up. 
But people who says, this is my target, this is why, they'll find a way. I was giving that um, example. You know, a lot of you um, heard in the news that in the United States, that baby formula is in crazy short supply. And there are other, there are actually parents. It's so sad. There are parents that drive store to store, sometimes four or five hours across state lines, just to be able to grab one formula for their baby. It's like, in this day and age, who would have thought, right? And I'm thinking about it, what is the lesson there? That shows you when they have a big enough why, the survival of their baby, they will do anything. The why. It's just like um, the story of the mini sto Zen story. There are many stories, different versions. Okay? There's this student came to a master, to a guru, to a sensei. I want to be enlightened. <laughs> There's a bucket of water. I said, come here. He grabbed the guy's head, put it underwater. <laughs> What do you desire the most? Air. <laughs> the teacher said, if you desire enlightenment, as much as you desire air right now, you will reach it. Why? A lot of us don't do anything because our why is non-existent or teeny tiny. It's one of those, it'd be nice, forget it, that's useless. It'd be nice. <laughs> right? What did Tony Robbins say? It's a, it's a should, it's a must. That's it. Clear? I know, that sounds like I'm giving you a sermon, but I have to speed up. I have <laughs> two more to go, and then in an hour, I'll have the second healing sessions for the seven-day purification. So that's right spiritual effort. I think you get the idea. Next one. <clears throat> right awareness and memory. All right, awareness. Let me just use this to make it easier for you. Give me a Chinese lesson. All right, nian, awareness in Chinese. And it's the first part. This here means now. Or if you say Jin, that's Jin. Jin Tian is today, or now in this calendar date, right? This one here is heart, Sin. So the two together gives you the context of what awareness is. Awareness is using your heart, okay, not your physical heart, don't get stuck there. The awareness of what's happening now. That's awareness. Okay, so right awareness has many levels of truth. Awareness is I, the soul, am aware that I'm the one perceiving everything. I'm perceiving that my words are harsh. I'm perceiving that my actions are hurtful or my thoughts are hurtful. So I need to change it. I'm noticing my heart, uh, not my heart, but I'm noticing with my awareness that, hey, I'm not doing enough service or I'm not saving enough money, I'm not doing it. All of that starts with awareness. So right awareness is very, very important for us to know what to do and what not to do. Now, the only reason it's connected to the heart because it's to differentiate the heart with the will, not your physical heart. Make sense? It's the heart chakra. So when you love someone, you notice every little thing that happens to them, right? If you're a parent, if you ask your kid, how are you doing today? I'm okay, mom. You go, no, you're not. How do you know? I'm your mom. You know, like a little blip, you know. However, I know this sounds bad. I apologize. But if there's somebody you don't care about, they could be in pain. They could be screaming, yelling. And then later on they go, I can't believe you didn't even notice I was upset. You look at them and go, oh, I didn't know you were upset. I didn't know you were hurting. You don't care. You're oblivious. Love allows a person to be very sensitive to every little fluctuation in the person's energy. But if you don't care for anyone, they could be screaming, yelling, they could be dying, you go, oh, I thought you were sleeping. <laughs> true or not true? 
That's why the heart chakra is involved in awareness. Being aware of the now, what's going on within me, outside of me. That's right, awareness. And of course, it goes beyond that, being aware of, am I following the virtues? Am I violating them? Am I being untruthful? Am I being hurtful with my thoughts, words, and actions? Am I aware? So, when you talk about awareness, the ones in the seven-day purification, I went through in more detail, but I want to share with you at least this much. There are several layers of awareness. Okay, let me see if I can show it to you right now so that you have it in front of you. Right awareness or right mindfulness. If I can find it. Here you go. If you're on Instagram, just listen and you just go to Facebook, massacre.org, panicking.com, and YouTube so you can see the, the presentation. Okay? Five levels of awareness. Look at this screen. Level zero. None. Zero. <laughs> you know, oblivious. Level one. We made a mistake. Okay, let me back off. Let's say we made a mistake. We did something bad, whatever it is. Level zero awareness is like we didn't even know we did something wrong. Level zero. Oblivious. Level one. After the mistake was, was done, let's say yesterday you shouted at someone or you said something hurtful. Today you go, man, I shouldn't have done that. That was wrong. Ooh, level one. Better than nothing, but a little too late. But it's okay. At least there's remorse. Okay, some of you go, remorse is not good. Remorse is good until it becomes excessive. Because if it's too excessive, or if it's excessive, then it becomes an obsession. You go, oh, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm bur burning in hell already. And then it, but your, your self-esteem goes down the toilet. Make sense? So remorse is good to the extent. Okay. Yeah. No, I can't believe it. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. In fact, you know, there's this science of apologizing. And if you know that, you can start looking up. There's a science of apologizing. And one of the things that people look at you to know you really meant it is if there's remorse. If there's no remorse, like your kid, you, you told your child, don't do this. You realize that you're not supposed to keep the, you know, have the stay, uh, forgot to turn off the stove. If the kid goes, yeah, I know, I won't do it again. You're going to go, yeah, right. But if, if the kid goes, mom, dad, I'm, I'm really sorry. I I know I could have burned the house down. I, I really sorry. I, I promise I won't do it again. I'm, I'm really, then by looking at you, you, go, okay, okay. There's remorse, good enough. It is part of it, like it or not. That's level one. Level two. Level two is, which is better. Remember, zero is none. One is like after the mistake, oh, oh it's good up. Level two is, while you're making the mistake, you wake up and go, I can't believe, it. what am I saying? Have you had that experience where you're doing something really dumb? We've done it before, right? You're doing something really dumb and stupid, screaming, yelling, or doing something stupid, and part of us go, what are you doing? Right? Part of you talking to yourself, what are you doing? Part of you go, I don't know. I know it's bad, but I'll do it anyway. Have you had that experience before? That's your higher soul and your lower soul kind of arguing. Anyway, that's for another topic. So during the mistake, you go, okay, I can't be, what am I doing? Hopefully that not much damage has been done, so you're able to stop yourself. It's still better than oblivious, level zero. It's still better than after the fact. You're doing it and you're able to minimize the damage by stopping yourself. Right? That's level two. Level three. What's level three? Awareness. Level three is, you go, oh, <clears throat> I know. When I meet this person in the past, it pisses me off. I'm going to unleash a bunch of explicatives out of my mouth and I'm going to be angry. I'm going to be doing this and this and this. I'm aware that that will happen. So to prevent that from happening, I'll bless the person with loving kindness and I'll walk in with the understanding that this person is going through a lot of pain and so therefore they're going to say something that's hurtful and I'm going to guard myself from unleashing all these bad words towards the person. For example, or you go, okay, I know, I know if I go to the grocery store and walk to the ice cream section, I'm going to look at those yummy, yummy, ice cream. I'm going to put five gallons in it and I'm going to go home and stuff myself. So, I'm not going to walk there. Good idea? Awareness before a mistake is made. Amazing. Some people call that intuition. 
premonition, whatever word you want to use. doesn't really matter. It's basically your higher soul says, hey, you, don't do that. <laughs> don't put yourself in that situation. Okay? So level zero, no awareness. Level one, after the mistake, we realize we screwed up. Level two is what? Doing the mistake, we realize, okay, 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 watch your words. Come on, you're getting too harsh. Level three is, which is better, before the mistake is made, okay, I see it coming. I'm anticipating, so I'm going to prevent myself from making that mistake. If you even get to number three, number two and number three, the world will change. If every person in the world knows this, the world will change. But there's something better. What's better is that tendency is gone. You go, how is that possible? It is. That's one of the things we practice in Arhatic Yoga. It's not good enough that we are harmless with our words, like we're stopping ourselves from screaming, yelling at someone. What's even better is that seed is not even there. The question is, how is it possible? I'll give you a very simple example. <clears throat> okay, very simple example. I know I'm going to go a little over time on this, but again, you're asking me to stuff everything we do in seven days <laughs> to in a few nights. But I want to make sure I can do, do you justice, be able to serve you that even though you're not part of the seven day, you can get something out of it to prepare yourself for the downpouring of energy on Sunday without charging a dime. Okay, listen carefully. I remember many years ago, we had some relatives, <laughs> we went to a restaurant. After the meal is over, you know, it's a relatively high-end restaurant. We start noticing, hey, wait, wait, how come uh, some of the glasses are gone and some of the, you know, like utensils, the silverware, go, some of it's gone. I didn't notice it, but you know, somebody else noticed. Well, what happened is those family members started a long time ago, to, you know, they were poor and they made more money, they became more successful, but they came from very poor beginnings. So for them, especially coming in, it's just like, wow, you know, that's an expensive stuff. It's just like we have some uh, Indian friends who, when they came to the United States, they went to a hotel, okay? They, they used to live in a village. They go to a hotel. And, you know, you go to a hotel, um, if this is a shower, they have a, you know, a shower cloth that you get out, so you step on it, right? And that person says, he was telling me, he says, I didn't know that was supposed to step on because for me, that is so white, I would never step on it. Okay, that's the context I'm dealing with. So this relative, these relatives, basically what they did is they <laughs> put some of the glasses, the silverware into their bags and stole it. Okay. And then when we're talking about it later, uh, some of the relatives and friends says, I can't believe they did that. It wouldn't even cross my mind. You heard the saying? The key words. You'll not even cross my mind. That's one. Of, uh, that's the one I want to focus on. What if there's a way for us to remove certain tendencies? Like, for example, if somebody irritates us, you just unleash a barrage of, you know, explicatives, swearing, all this stuff. <laughs> you are a piece of this and piece of that, and your daughter of this and son of that, whatever curse words. You've done it before. What if your awareness? Is such that, number one, when you're doing it, you're able to stop yourself. Okay, that's number, number, what the heck is that? Number two, okay? Then as you keep practicing your spiritual practice, you start noticing, aha, uh -huh, I know that when I'm with this person, I will watch my words so I will not curse them out. Hmm. But what if, when I meet this person, which I used to scream and yell and curse, this time when I meet them, It didn't even cross my mind. Or there's no urge or anything to even come out and say something that's hurtful. What if you can do that? That's level four where the seed was already removed. Yes, it can be done. You know why? Several things. Number one, every thought, every emotion, every tendency to do good or do bad, to say good, say bad, you know, anything, any of these are all fabrications of the soul. 
So if we get to a level of awareness saying, ah, oh, okay, these bad words have been saying before, all right. Even though I've been doing it for the last 40 years, I'm not going to do it anymore. The soul has enough control over the speech, right speech, right thoughts, right action. They don't do it. That means the seed is removed. It's not easy. It can be done. It's just that in our Hatha Yoga, we have certain techniques like blue triangle. We have a certain super sharp crystal to break up that tendency because we treat everything as what? Energy. So, two things are happening. You remove these tendencies, simultaneously you're aware, so you guard your consciousness from doing it. Your spiritual development accelerates. That's right awareness. Right awareness means you know who is doing the awareness thingy, which is the soul. So none of these excuses, I can't help it. Oh, he made me do it. When he said that, I just can't help myself. My fist came up and it traveled at 50 miles per hour towards the trajectory of his jaw. It just happened. I can't help it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> none of that. That's right awareness. Okay? Let's keep going. Oh, there's a second part to it. Right awareness and memory. All right, listen carefully. I want to put this out there. We'll cover this. So the ones in the seven day, I'll cover this in detail. What is right memory? Right memory, the Buddha remembered all his lifetimes and causes and the causes and effects in the present. Okay, two lessons there. Number one, don't ask to know everything in your past life. We covered this in one of the lessons before because you don't know <laughs> what you did before. Some people say, well, I want to know so that... Um, I don't make the mistake again, same mistake again. That's great. Very noble uh, intention. Here's the problem. You're judging everything based on your morals and your understanding in the present moment. What if, what if the mistake we made was during ancient times when people were still barbaric? Or you're part of a certain army that conquers certain lands and that's how you gained your lessons of leadership. But in the process, he slaughtered hundreds of people. If we don't have the maturity to understand it in context, guess what happens? You start feeling, oh, I'm such a sinner. I'm such a screw up. I killed so many people. Although at that time, that's how things are. Or here's another one. At that time, women can have as many husbands or men could have as many wives. But you have a very strict code based on your religion right now. It's only one for one. Then you saw what you were before. Before or not, you're riddled with guilt. That's not right memory. Plus, you don't have to remember the exact incident that allowed you to learn the lesson to retain the lesson. That's why some of you go, you're doing something, you go, this doesn't feel right. Because the soul or realize, I learned that lesson of not to do whatever it is. You don't need to remember every detail. You just need to remember the lesson. So in the case of the Buddha, at that level of enlightenment, he is awake to who he is, who he is and all the mistakes he's made and all the corrections he made to get to where he is today at that moment. That's right memory. Now, for us, little beings, here's how you apply right memory. Forgive and forget the mistakes of others quickly and remember their kindness and their kindness acts eternally. Write it down. Forgive and forget the mistakes of others quickly, but remember and retain the good and kind acts they did towards us forever. That's right memory. Easier said than done. But that's what we strive for. Somebody has heard us, and you heard this me a thousand times or more. Let the matter pass. Otherwise, I'll say it again, you're not going to like it. If you don't know how to let go and move on, you're looking at a life of misery. Period. Try to prove me wrong. People who cannot forgive and let go, it's a life of misery. 
they retain every detail. Yeah, they said this to me, they heard me this, and literally just have a catalog and even have a spreadsheet of every screw up people did to you. Good luck. You're going to be miserable. I'll say it like it is. You don't want to hear it? It's your problem. Until you break out of it, you're going you're gonna to suffer. That's what the Lord Buddha said. Noble truth number three. Suffering can end. However, how long before it ends, it's a matter of choice. The soul decides, enough. I want to be happy. I want to live. I want to grow. Or the soul says, nah, I'll let it just kind of ride. This person hurt me. I'm going to be angry. Uh, I'm going to be this. I'm going to that. And before you know it, those thought forms control the person and their misery. They're miserable. It's just like the story of King Saul. Remember? In uh, King Saul and David, he was very, very, King Saul was very, very uh, jealous of David. And so what happened? The story goes, read your, I forgot which book it is in the Old Testament. What did the story say? King Saul was tormented by demons. You have to realize, in ancient times, they don't have the word elementals or energy beings. So the word demon... In Greek, demonia simply means energy being that vibrate at a lower level. So when our thoughts become so strong of hatred, jealousy, anger, and envy, these thought forms get so strong, they become living entities that live in the aura. That's what is meant when King Saul was tormented by, be by demons that he created. Oh, by the way, you know, law of attraction thingy. People like to quote it. Guess what? If the ore is populated by all these type of thought forms and elementals, they attract their cousins, their buddies, and their drinking buddies. The opposite is also true. If the thought forms you create are happy, joyful, forgiving, loving, and caring, those are the, what you attract. Oh, by the way, they're called angels. That's it. That's the meaning of right memory. Right awareness. Being aware of what you do, what you think, how you feel, and being aware that, oh, I keep remembering that person who hurt me, and I am keep going through all that pain. Uh, it's not good. Okay, I'm aware of it. Okay, stop. I do my best to ask for divine blessings of peace and love with them, and move on and focus on what I want. That's right awareness. I know some of you are commenting, oh, this and that, whatever. Take it or leave it. I'm not here to please you. I'm not here to make you happy. I'm here to do my job, which is to help you grow. That's my, what my teacher did to me. He didn't do it because that way he'll be happy and whatever. He did it because he wanted me to grow. So it was painful though. So hopefully I'm not causing pain. That's not an intention, but at least I'm telling it like the way I was taught. So hopefully it will help you. Let's move on. So after right thought, Hey, I'm sorry, after right awareness and memory is right oneness. There's a lot more to it. Uh, tomorrow we'll go through it in more detail. Right concentration and oneness. Okay? That's eightfold path number <clears throat> number eight. <laughs> That's right, eight. Right oneness. Uh, geez, that's a lot. Okay, let me oversimplify for the sake of time. Right concentration. Part of it is knowing the difference between concentration and meditation. That's, if you've been with me in um, <clears throat> the class Achieving Oneness with the Higher Soul, which is, if you don't have, you haven't, you can go get the book. Ah, I don't have it here. Somebody borrowed it. Anyway. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Okay. So, as I just went through in more detail, concentration and meditation, or concentration and awareness. Concentration is using your will, projecting the energy forward. Right? You're concentrating. You're taking your energy and giving it a focal point. That's concentration. Awareness or meditation is the opposite, waiting for the information to come to you. So one is projecting, the other one is receiving. 
So right concentration could mean knowing the difference. Because some people, they're meditating. You know, I'm concentrating on this mantra. I'm concentrating on this visualization. And somebody asks you, well, what did you experience after? Nothing. You know why? Because you're pushing, you're pushing, you're pushing. You're not allowing the information to come to you. Oh, yeah, it feels loving. It feels joyful. It feels this. That part is awareness. Remember? Using your heart. Awareness, meditating, let the data come to you. That's one reason why I don't have, people don't have experience. I'm the poster child. <laughs> I remember the first few years, um, actually for quite a number of years, I'll be in a group meditating with all my colleagues and the other pranic healers and arhatic yogis. And then after the whole thing is done, Master Chow will say, okay, let's share some experiences. Everybody say, oh, there was so much bliss, so much love, I saw light, I saw waterfall, I saw an angel, I saw Jesus, I saw this. I'm looking at them going, what if you guys have been smoking? I don't even a darn thing. <laughs> and then some people say, yeah, I saw the light, it was so bright. I'm going, wait, let's talk about the light. Meditation to enhance you visualize a light on top of your head. What's there to see? I didn't see anything. You know, when he said, be aware of the light, Look at the light. I'm going, okay, how bright is the light? Is it a 10-watt bulb, 1,000-watt bulb? How bright is it? How high is it? Is it big? Is it small? It says above your head. Am I looking from below? Looking from the top? Looking from the side? What do you mean? You know, an engineer. By the time I kept going and going, he goes, come back to your body. I never left. Then many years later, I found out I was concentrating when I was supposed to be what? Just being aware. Being aware means what? Shut up and wait for it to come to you. <laughs> Get the idea? Some of you go, I never thought of that. Exactly. Just one little aha could make all the difference in the world. Wrong concentration versus right concentration. Now, another, um, another, what do you call this, part of this teaching of right concentration is choosing what you focus on. Choosing what you focus on. You have the ability to decide what you focus on. Right? A lot of you came from UP Delhi with Tony's events. There are many choices you can make. First choice is deciding what you focus on. You can focus on what's right or you can focus on what could go wrong. <laughs> Isn't it? That is the soul deciding. So right concentration also involves, I want to focus on what could go well. I want to focus on the good things that happen in my life. I want to focus on what are the possibilities that I can achieve. Rather than, I can focus on all my screw-ups, I can focus on all the people who have hurt me, or I can focus on, it's a choice. So right concentration is to concentrate on those things that are helpful for me, things that will make me grow, things that will help me serve people, Wrong concentration will be concentrated on the other stuff we mentioned. By the way, concentration creates thought forms. If you keep thinking about failure, the thought forms you create will populate your aura, and of course you will fail. You concentrate on succeeding and the results of it, those concent concentrated effort will produce positive thought form that will push you to success. And all is said and done, can't blame other people. I, the soul, make choices. I screwed it up. I own up to it. I succeeded. It's part of my effort too. That's truly loving yourself. Lying to yourself is not loving yourself. Get that through your head. I've talked to some people, I love myself, I'm going to focus on myself. Even though I screw up, it's okay. I keep, keep screwing up because it's me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll see you 10 lifetimes from now. Because as long as you don't own up to it, that it's a screw up, I make it better, you keep repeating. And the last part, right oneness. Right oneness is something like this. Many levels of truth. Some people, they go, I'm one with the air. Right? Nothing wrong with that. I'm one with, the, as I walk in the grass, I'm one with the earth. I'm one with this one. That's great. That's wonderful. That's good. However, that is not the objective. 
It's not objective. You can do it all day long. I'm one with the earth. Uh, and? Okay, I'm grounded. And? Get the idea? So all those oneness with this oneness that leads to a certain path, which is the first oneness, which is oneness with your higher soul. Then, as you experience oneness with who you really are on the higher levels, you experience that I, the spiritual I, the higher I, the higher self, the higher soul, is one and connected with all higher souls. With all the great spiritual teachers, connected and one with God and one with all. That is right oneness. Everything else like, oh, I'm one with the air, I'm one with that tree, I'm one with nature. Those are just stepping stones to get to one with God, one with all. Okay? So I hope that gave you the big picture. Um, so number one is what? Right viewpoint. The most important one. The vantage point. I'm the soul. I'm the spiritual self. I'm the center of my circumference. From here, that's my vantage point. I look at everything. And from there, I see the body, the emotions, and thoughts are my vehicles, my instruments, my tools that belong to me. So from then, I produce right thoughts. I use these tools to produce right speech, right action. Repeated right thoughts, speech, and action produce what? Right lifestyle. From there, now that I know what's right, I can just sit on my ass and go, okay, I know what's right. No, you do something, move towards it. That's right effort, spiritual effort and exertion. Then as you're doing it, you're moving towards your objective, you have to practice awareness. Uh -huh. The awareness allows you to maneuver through life. You know, people, they just keep going. They're so bullheaded. Oh, this is my objective. They're not, there's no awareness. So they don't realize the conditions are changing. The audience is changing. Your customers are changing. The economic, they're not, there's no awareness. So what happens? Bullheadedness ends in disaster. But awareness allows you to adjust, adjust, adjust. Right, awareness. And ultimately, oneness with God, oneness with all. That's the Eightfold Path. There are many books on it. There are many classes. There are many things you can search. All we did was give you the key points. And the ones who are the seven-day purification, um, you know, I'll go into more detail with two more days to go. And if you're not able to join it, um, for whatever reason, I hope I was able to at least give you some summary to help you understand it more, so to trigger your curiosity to learn more. And God willing, we'll do it again every year. Just like the Lord Buddha instructed every year, the four noble truths, eightfold path have to be taught because humanity forgives, uh, forgives, forgets. Now, I'm just going to say something that might uh, mess with some of your minds. The eightfold path, the four noble truths, eightfold path is not just for human beings. It's not just for human beings. Even nature spirits and certain angelic beings or devas are studying the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path in their dimension. Just thought throw that in there. In fact, there's this story, <clears throat> again, very hard to validate. You know, it was shared by a Zen master who said the first instance of awareness came when the Lord Buddha was in a setting where he had the physical disciples. He was teaching and certain devas or angelic beings and the uh, head devas, uh, mahadevas, great angelic beings, you know, archangels and higher, were listening to the lecture of the Buddha. You notice I left it at the end because it might be too weird to start and, you know, you guys might turn me off. But now we can turn me off, we're done. Okay, Hear me out. I, I find this amazing. The story goes on like this. The great teacher was teaching and then... <clears throat> he was going to teach awareness, what real awareness is. So the teacher held up a lotus flower and said nothing. Said nothing. Everybody's going. And according to the story, again, let me, I hope I remember this correctly, one of the Deva kings, one of the kings of certain angelic class of angels, looked at it, looked at it when the Buddha was like this, and prostrated. At that point, the Buddha knew he understood awareness. I'll let you meditate on it. Let's give thanks. To the Divine Supreme God, Divine Father, Mother, 
So all the spiritual elders, holy masters, all the saints of all traditions, archangels, holy angels, and spiritual helpers. To my beloved and respected teacher, Grandmaster Tokok Sui, Mahaguji Meiling, to all the higher beings, to the Lord Buddha, to the Lord Christ, and all the great spiritual teachers, known and unknown to the world, thank you, thank you, thank you for the wisdom, the guidance, the help, divine protection. Thank you for guiding us towards the light. We thank you in full faith. So be it, so be it, so it is. All right, so next step, next stop is the Wesak Festival. Um, if you go to masko.org, you know, even if you're not part of the seven-day purification, you're welcome to join us for the actual Wesak Festival, which would be 8 p.m. I hope I got that right. 8 p.m. California time. And uh, you have to register, sign up for it. <clears throat> so we'll have the eight, we'll, there'll be a talk, a, a quick Four Noble Truth Eightfold Path. There's a lot of stuff I didn't cover here that I'll cover there. And then there's going to be a break. And in that break, actually, it's not a break. After my talk, to just kind of remind everyone, there'll be a, a 17 minute video of my teacher, Grand Master Talk Hoksui, talking about the five virtues. And um, I've watched that video several times. It's amazing. It's simple, direct to the point. Um, as I've told you, all of you, I owe him to who I am today. Uh, from He took a total screw-up kid to somebody who kind of knows something, and I cannot take credit for, credit for it. I give credit to my teacher. So there's a video to be shown to er everyone. And then after his um, video where he talks about the five, no, uh, five virtues, there's a short pee pee break, toilet break, and then we dive into the Wesak Festival meditation. And if you want to time it, it's going to be 55 minutes. It's a meditation. You go, what? 55 minutes? Ah, my ass will get, get sore in 55 minutes. Anyway, get a nice pillow. I don't know what it is. But if you're really meditating, listen, I'll leave you one thought. If you're in deep meditation, really experiencing oneness, you don't even feel your body. That's why some of you, in deep meditation, at some point, you go like this. <gasps> like you have to remind yourself to breathe. Now, you know, you're really meditating who you are, on who you are. Okay, I think of, I've yacked for over an hour. I hope you got something out of it. Atma, Atma means soul, Namaste. We will see you Sunday for the meditation and make sure you register for it. It's not going to be broadcasted everywhere because not everybody's really interested. We want to make sure that, you know, really get the most out of it and harness that energy. Oh, one more thing. Uh, after the meditation, uh, the last part of meditation, we're going to be blessing projects. I'm not the one blessing. I'm just going to aim the energy. Everyone has amassed so much spiritual energy. You want to write down all your goals and aspirations. Everything from health goals, uh, someone needs healing in your life, your finances, relationship, whatever it is, write it down. And then after the meditation, with so much energy, you're just going to project all that energy and blessings to make it materialize faster for you. It's magic. Okay. Namaste, y'all. Y'all. And uh, the ones who are in the um, seven-day purification healing session, we will start in about 25 minutes. Make sure you have your salt water bucket, the ones who are joining us. We're going to focus on, what is it now? Anti-laziness. We're disintegrating laziness and procrastination. Okay? So we're going to dig. Atma. To all of you, Atmas, Namaste. We will see you in on Sunday or in a few hours or in, in a few minutes. God bless. Take care.